With increasing numbers of cars on the road in the U.S. each year, car accidents have unfortunately become a common sight. Many people die as a result of car accidents, with many more receiving serious injuries. Such injuries and death often leave the victims and their families devastated. Here are some shocking car accident statistics which the Insider Exclusive hopes makes people aware about trends in car accidents and thus hopefully reducing the number of car accidents in the United States. On an average, there are more than 6 million car accidents on the roads in the U.S. annually. More than 3 million people get injured due to car accidents with more than 2 million of these injuries being permanent. There are in excess of 40,000 deaths due to car accidents every year. The majority of car accidents could have been avoided if only the drivers would drive more responsibly. About 40% of car accident fatalities occur because of drunk driving. And about 30% of the car accident fatalities can be attributed to speeding. Another 33% and above because of reckless driving that causes the car to go off the road and result in an accident. Every 12 minutes, one person dies because of a car accident. And every 14 seconds, a car accident results in an injured victim. The leading cause of death in the age group of 1 to 30 years old is due to being involved in a car accident. People most severely injured in car accidents are between 15 and 24 years old and above 75 years of age. In this Insider Exclusive Investigative Special, we go behind the headlines in Auto Accidents, Melissa Miller's story to examine how Buddy Yosha and Jason Schartzer, partners at Yosha, Cook, Schartzer, and Tisch, successfully represented Melissa in one of those everyday tragic accidents that could have happened to any one of us. On February 15, 2007, at approximately 9 a.m., Melissa Miller was driving her 2003 Chevy Impala to work when an 18,000-pound semi-tractor trailer smashed into her and she suffered multiple injuries to multiple parts of her body with the most severe injury being a brain injury with significant memory loss. At the end of a two-day trial, the jury awarded Melissa a $1 million verdict. Throughout their careers, Buddy Yosha and Jason Schartzer have earned reputations as unyielding advocates and lawyers who regularly represent individual men, women, and families against large corporations and repeatedly win. Buddy and Jason have earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as some of the best trial lawyers in Indianapolis, in Indiana, and across the nation, and have built substantial reputations nationwide by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. Buddy and Jason's spirit and dedication is often compared to President Teddy Roosevelt's, especially when it comes to being in the courtroom, in the arena they know so well. For as they often say, it is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or the doer of deeds could have done it better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, daring greatly so that his place shall never be amongst those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Buddy's and Jason's amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide their clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from Indianapolis, Indiana, at the law firm of Yosha, Cook, Schartzer, and Tisch. It is my great pleasure to introduce Buddy Yosha and Jason Schartzer to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your firm. You represent the little guy primarily, don't you? Yes, I do strictly personal injury litigation. And as soon as I got out of law school, I gra gravitated to personal injury work. Challenging, uh, had some uh, glamour to it by representing the little guy. A lot of challenges. And uh, back then, it was fairly lucrative. And I've done that for almost 50 years now. It's uh, gotten tougher over the years. 
to represent the little guy, hasn't so it? So-called insurance crisis and uh, tort yeah. reform yeah. Uh, that's been out there for about, well, forever, but more pronounced in the last 20, 25 years. You have been practicing for 50 years? Close to it, 63, 48 years. 48 years, and Jason, you recently became a lawyer about 10 years ago, correct? Well, it's about eight years ago, but yeah. I've been working with Buddy for about nine years. And you immediately went to work for a plaintiff's firm, didn't you? I did. For Why is that? For Buddy. Um, it is, uh, it's just the kind of law that uh, that suited the way that I, uh, the, the kind of the things I wanted to do in this profession. It would help individuals against corporations and against insurance companies, and that's yeah. exactly what I wanted to do. Today we have a case of a mom, mother of two, Melissa Miller, who was hit by a truck, who took a, basically a wide turn. Before we start talking about the case, tell us a little bit about Melissa Miller and why you decided to take the case. What was it appealing about Melissa that you wanted to do this? Well, it sounded like a, 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 a horrific wreck when, when I first spoke with her. Um, she was hit by a semi as a... Uh, she was driving down the road. The semi was attempting to make a wide right turn, and she got uh, uh, caught by the front cab and uh, ran off the road and then had a second impact uh, into a snowbank and, uh, and a pole. Mm -hmm. um, when I first uh, spoke with Melissa, she had uh, indica indicated that she was having memory loss and pain all over, and I, I, I felt bad for her. Now, the big issue in this case was whose fault was it, right? Who is at fault? The liability issue. Well, isn't it? Uh, it um, what happened? It happened in uh, Indianapolis. So, uh, uh, Melissa was 31 at the time, a nurse on her way mm -hmm. to work at a doctor's office, and it happens in an intersection. And uh, she's in the right lane, what she thought was minding her own business, and uh, a semi is in her left lane that swings out to the dedicated turn lane and. Uh, uh, makes a right turn and get no chance for her to do anything. The impact, it sounds like, because it was a semi, but it was moderately heavy. It wasn't mild, yeah. and it hit her right on the door. Right. And um, the liability was fairly clear, and they, um, they contested it, though, for obvious reasons. Sometimes, you know, all you have to do is convince one or two people on a jury yeah. that there's comparative fault that we have in Indiana, and they may allocate a percentage, but it was a disputed liability case they say we should have seen his turn signal but the semis uh, pretty long it was it was a long semi and she's already past the point where she'd see that signal so that that was the big dispute yeah and uh, uh, like Jason said that the first day though she uh, they they asked uh, the officer asked if she wanted to go to the emergency room she says no and she went to work that day and went to the emergency room that night with pain all over her body and um, they, a uh, week later, took MRIs of literally all over her body, and they mm -hmm. found that she had a ruptured disc, a herniated disc uh, that um, uh, was objective. There was no question it was provable. What wasn't so provable was her memory loss and the brain injury that she alleged. And uh, what happened was, uh, uh, all through the case at her deposition under oath, she focused more on her memory loss and her brain dysfunction and her maladies all over her body and hardly ever mentioned her ruptured disc that she was treated for for yeah. the two and a half years before trial. Now, this was, in, I remember reading, this was a rather unusual case because what happened the first day of trial? Well. I, I get in, I, I'm giving opening statement and, and telling the jury what happened. And uh, as soon as opening statement, we tell what we're gonna intend to prove. In opening statement, I told the jury that she's got these symptoms of, of a memory loss, but uh, Jason had her take neurological testing and uh, the, the, the neural psych test didn't show anything uh, that would validate a claim for a closed head injury and everything else we couldn't validate. But I told the jury as a result, we're not going to ask for damages for that because we can't prove them. 
Yeah. But what we can prove is the ruptured disc, and that will be indisputable. And we told the jury that. Well, I sit down, the defense gives her opening statement, then I look around and he tells me our client's gone. She got up and walked out. I thought it was something the defense counsel has said that offended her. Yeah. And it, it turns out it was she walked out during my opening statement. Right. I don't know to this minute why she did it. Right, but you've never had this happen. Oh, your never. client. No, you are representing your client. They get up, they walk out. This makes an impact turns on the jury. Out it's something I said, and this was very unusual. Yeah. We go looking for her. his paralegal, Jason's paralegal, Jamie, was founder on the first floor of the courthouse building. And we go down, I go down and, and talk to her. She was out there. She was detached. Uh, glazed eyes. Uh, I, I couldn't get through to her. Finally, she says she wants to go home. And I says, you go home and we'll explain it to the judge and we'll see if you can't come back tomorrow. Mm. Yeah, we weren't sure what caused it. So we go upstairs back to the courthouse and the judge says that at the same time a juror wrote him a note said that he saw me talking to her that it looked like it may have been staged yeah. to tell her to go home and we'd explain it to the judge. Well that would be that was bizarre because you don't get any benefit by sending your client and home and saying we'll tell the judge you're sick. Yeah, yeah. but you I bet you were a little bit worried because now you have well, a yeah. juror. Terrible. You terrible. have a juror on on the jury right now that's not gonna do you right. No, <laughs> we he had thinks uh, you're up to some shenanigans. We yeah. had no uh, the, we had to poll the jury mm -hmm. and see what impact it had. And unfortunately, this juror said that he had suspicions before this about the case, and now that validated when it looked like we're putting on and staging yeah. the show. Well, I don't know where his suspicions came from because the case hadn't even put on a witness yet. Yeah. And we always ask on Vore Dyer, do you have any preconceived ideas as to how this case ought to come out, you know, mm -hmm. without regard to knowing our facts? And he should have told us something then. Yeah. So then we pull each and every juror, and one was a health counselor for an insurance company, and he says, I explained to the other jurors, Indiana has rules now that the jurors can start taking their notes and talking on breaks, and you couldn't used to do that until yeah. the case was over. And he says, I explained to them that this lady walked out because of the vicissitudes and stresses of trial. Right. And we think that's what it was. That night, she was in the hospital on intravenous medication in the emergency room the whole night, comes back to court the next morning fresh in a new person. Did the jury know where she had been the, the previous no, night? No, we they never, never had were, to explain they never it, were no. But what happened, we end up trying the first day of the case without our client, and the judge says he had to get rid of the uh, juror that uh, was poisoned. It starts talking about, I had a, a preconceived right. ideas like suspicions before. Well, the judge says I had to excuse him. Now, do we go with a, what could be a poisoned jury or do we proceed with five on the jury and both sides agreed, let's get it over with because it could be worse on this client the next time. So we yeah. decided to go ahead and try the case. Well, that was lucky that the judge got rid of that jury. Well, yes, I was just thinking of that uh, recently <laughs> as I reviewed my notes because you know what happens. If you yeah. have a good result, this person was going to water down that yeah, jury. Sure. So, so I was kind of wondering how you reached the verdict you did if that person was still no, on the jury. No, he went bye-bye. Yeah. Mm -mm. Now, to prove the case, what are some of the issues you had to prove to win this case? What was your strategy? Well, the big one was liability, uh, to, first of all, because without that, you can't yeah. get the damages. Um, I think the key to liability in the case was uh, the officer's testimony, who he indicated that when he arrived at the scene of the collision, he spoke to the semi-driver, and the semi-driver said he had, did not move his truck from the time of the impact and the semi-driver's truck was in a left turn lane. So not only did he make swing left to make a wide right turn, he went three lanes over, yeah. was in a left turn lane when he was trying to make that right turn and hit our client. Mm -hmm. and I think that was the important part of establishing liability in the semi was at fault. Mm -hmm. um, now, there was one very important part that I saw in your notes on this case was that you did not ask for lost wages, did you? Well, the problem we had, uh, it was his Normally decision. you wouldn't. Normally, Normally you would do. in an accident. Uh, Jason made a proper decision to not ask for loss of wages because she had a lot of employment problems uh, on her job. And part of it was 
She had a, a, a 13, two daughters. Yeah. One was 13 at the time of trial and, and was autist, uh, yeah. had a, a, an autistic personality. Right. And she had to take care of her a lot and miss a lot of work over that. And I think the last several, several months before trial, she was just taking care of her daughter. And so we told the jury that we weren't asking for lost wages. Well, uh, if you saw the movie with Paul Newman verdict, uh, uh, where the jury's deliberation and they go their way and they write a note to the judge, can we award more than what the plaintiff has asked for? Well, it was reminiscent uh, of our case. A juror wrote the judge dur uh, during trial, because they're allowed to talk during trial, can we award lost wages even though the plaintiff hasn't asked for it? And the judge said? No. And that's what it was. And we still think we made the right move because you had a good case yeah. on the injury alone. And if you guild, you could gild the lily, yeah. make it, trying to make it a great case, yeah. we could have got hurt. Now, interesting, you, your initial offer to settle this case was how much? $50,000 Yeah, was the, was the offer before From the them, trial. from them. From the other side, yeah. Yeah, but what you're, you had asked for 148000 correct? The, the initial, yeah. The, so when you're talking about the verdict, they came back with a million-dollar verdict, correct? Right. Which was huge. Were you kind of shocked about it? Um, I wasn't there. I wasn't shocked. It is, I got it a phone is, call. <laughs> I don't watch them anymore. That, that moment in time when uh, a, a verdict is read and yeah. after you've gone through the whole trial, it's kind of surreal uh, yeah. anyways. And when, when you hear the numbers in a verdict like that, you replay it in your head. Did they really say that? Did they say this? Yeah. I mean, it, it really is uh, surreal. And, and eventually, with her, they attributed some liability to her, 16%, correct? 16%, which yeah. I thought was not proper. I thought yeah. it was 100%. And I, I see now Cause, these... Because you're in the lane, you're turning uh, left, a big truck's coming around, anything. right? She couldn't have done anything. She, yeah. when she that guy moves anything. in front of her, she's past the point of no escape. She's yeah. going to get hit no matter what she does. So w did you poll the jury afterwards about why they well, well, were happy? He didn't yeah. Yeah. And well, in some situations, too, when yeah. internal negotiations are going on between jurors, yeah. that's a way to compromise a dollar amount is to do yeah. that is by add percentage of liability right. uh, just to make the number right. Yeah. So. Now, a lot of people have car accidents. You know, every day they have car accidents. Um, and Melissa's case is just one of them, which you've got a great verdict on. Uh, why is it important to hire an attorney when you have a car accident? And why is it important to hire an experienced attorney? Well, I think it, the, it, the big distinction is, uh, is, is your leverage with an insurance company. A person yeah. who tries to represent themselves against an insurance company is at somewhat of a disadvantage because they do that all the time. And I think unless you can uh, pose a legitimate um, threat of taking a case to trial, right. you really can't, uh, or it's, hard, it's difficult to get what you're really entitled to. When you have a car accident, what's the important things to do immediately? If you have a car accident, Melissa didn't go to the hospital to get yeah. checked out. If you, somebody How did that work against time, her? How did that work against it her? It didn't, but it could. If she'd have waited a week when the MRI was taken, People then say, if there's time that goes by, what yeah. if somebody says, I'm, I don't believe in claims and I don't want to make a claim? Yeah. And they think, I'm going to get through this initial pain and it doesn't go away. And you don't get to a doctor for a month. Yeah. Then the doctor says, it's, or in the, in the insurance company says, it's not connected if she didn't hurt, right. something and, else did and it. And another thing is, if they went back to work, right? Mm -hmm. They would say, well, this injury really didn't hurt and you. That's, that's, they did, that's right? the thing that saved Melissa in this case is she worked for a medical doctor. Yeah. So even though she mm -hmm. went to work after she that, went to the doctor. she went to the doctor as yeah. well because right. she worked for a doctor. But, it, yeah, in other cases it can uh, create an issue because if you wait too long, yeah. they say, well, you know, you must not have been hurt. You know, you're constantly faced when you take a case uh, of either settling or taking it at trial. And today, for example, you might win a case at a trial level. You think you have a good shot. But you know the insurance company may appeal it, and the appellate court might not be as favorably disposed towards individuals or large verdicts. And maybe your state Supreme Court could be definitely anti-consumer, anti-plaintiff. So you have a lot of factors to figure in when you are going to decide whether you want to settle a case or take it to trial. What's the key thing that you look at? 
uh, what, what's the chance of upholding this verdict on appeal. That's a big factor. It is. Uh, judges have a tendency, there are, you don't see as many liberal judges because co so many of them come from government. Yeah. And uh, 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 working for the, some of them worked for the state in the past yeah. and everything, and they're not accustomed to, uh, they, they, see, they understand that, uh, especially if you're going against a municipality, you know, they protect government assets. Yeah. And it's not easy to get a case upheld. We used to have a problem years ago with strict liability verdicts mm -hmm. that lawyers would get because even though it was the law of the land and Indiana accepted that, it's still hard to get cases yeah. like that to say that, that without regard to fault, we're gonna uphold the verdict just yeah. because that product went out there because of its design or what have you. Well, let's hope as a result of this show, more people are aware of who your, what your law firm is all about and the success you've had in dealing with insurance companies and considering all the factors and getting success, the rightful success that your clients need. And I want to thank both of you for being on the program. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you thank so you. much. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.